If you agree that the name of the Lord is the greatest name of all, then say amen. 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 This, this day in which many of our brothers and sisters around the, the country are thinking of, of the sanctity of human life, uh, I want to remind you of an obvious topic that, that uh, should be addressed and should be in our minds that uh, as of today, as of this morning at 8.37 a.m., one, one of the counters that I looked at estimating the number of abortions in the United States since 1973 was at the figure 58,635,120. That's lower than some, I think. Worldwide, 1.4 billion since 1980. And uh, 6.9 million by Planned Parenthood since 1970. So there's some of the statistics. It is clear then that uh, there is an epidemic of disregard for the sanctity of human life. The solution to that problem is to go and see what God's Word says about this. And so I'd like to invite you to open to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look in verses 26 and 27. And we're going to see in a couple of places in Scripture how we ought to think of life and how we ought to see death as the enemy and, and what the Lord Jesus considers to be a to be covered under the law's prohibition of murder and it's uh, it's sobering in in many ways it's to be celebrated though and there's some very good news we have very specific instructions as to how we can obey what the Lord wants to celebrate the sanctity of human life it's not only the abortion issue that we're talking about it has to start at a at a more foundational level than that what is life why would we say that there's anything sacred about it? And uh, that's what we're going to look at uh, today. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Father, I come to you now and I pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds to the reality, the truth of the sanctity of human life by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that, that we would not simply see this as something to consider as we cast balance in elections, but that we'd see, we would see that our, our every moment that we are in relationship and in fellowship with one another, we have the opportunity to celebrate and promote the biblical view, the true view of human life and, and to recognize the sanctity of human life. Help us, the Lord, to see the truth and all its implications today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, I want you to see from this passage that mankind is the creation of God and thus his possession. Mankind is the creation of God and thus his possession, which is how... God can say in Ezekiel 18, 4, Behold, all souls are mine. And I found that that verse uh, works very well when you are confronted with someone who is cynical or does uh, not want to take seriously the, a conversation about being right with the Lord or who is uh, approaching uh, the, the discussion as if he's dealing with some religious fanatic or something. When, when we come to the, the realization that the Bible says, the Bible contains the claim of God, behold, all souls are mine. 
And the end of that verse is the soul of the, sin, the, the, the soul of the sinner shall die. The soul of the one who sins shall die. And so that is a serious and sobering claim that God makes. And it goes back to the fact that we're his possession. We're his possession because he made us. He made us. Let us make man. Now don't be confused or thrown off where some have tried to throw in some controversy here because this is a different word uh, in the Hebrew than uh, Genesis 1.1. There's no problem whatsoever in that. Genesis 1.1, uh, when we read, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the word there does refer to an ex nihilo creation. That is, out of nothing, God brought into existence that which was not. There have been some who would argue about that word bara in the Hebrew and say it doesn't necessarily means, mean that, but in all of Scripture, we see God described as the one who brings into existence out of nothing. He brings uh, that which is nothing into something. And I heard uh, Tabidi Anyabwile uh, say one time while he was preaching that that nothingness leapt into existence. Simply to obey God's command. And that's what happened. Now, when you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, you find this. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So there's no problem here. God has brought into existence, brought into to being that which was not, and then from that which he made into being, he formed and created the, the particular uh, making or fashioning of man. And there's, there's, So there's two words used here. Let us make man in our image, and then he formed man from the dust of the ground. But all of this is impossible without that bara, without that ex nihilo creation, bringing into existence out of nothing that which now exists. So... Uh, we have the verb here, asa, versus bara in Genesis 1-1, but there's no problem because this forming of the dust, which is form, is another verb. That's the asa, uh, but it's comprehended, it's included in the bara of God bringing into uh, existence everything, everything. Um, listen, if it's not God, it's created by God need to know that. need to understand that. If it is not God, it is created by God. It's only two categories. God and His creation. Everything fits into those categories. God and His creation. God is not God because He has achieved the rank of God. God is not God because He has performed well and has been awarded with the status of God because by definition, God is the highest being there can be. There's no one to award that rank to Him. He's God. He is self-existent. And that's why the Bible can just begin with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we think about the sanctity of human life, what we find in verse 26 is that mankind is the creation of God and thus His possession. He formed man, mankind to be exactly what mankind is and he created the elements with which he made man. In every way, God is the author of human life. Secondly, mankind is considered a creation of God resulting from consultation within the Trinity. John Calvin had some helpful thoughts on this. He did point out, we need to remember God summons no foreign counselors. So when we see in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. Let us. When he's saying let us, that is showing us that God is doing something that is considered and specific and intentional and it is different from the description of everything up to this point. And God said, and God said, let there be. And God said, let there be. And God said, let there be. And then it comes to this. Let us make man. Now the plural there certainly includes 
the notion that his power is exponentially and, and really infinitely uh, comprehended in that the plurality of that, that, that it's plural, let us. But certainly the rest of scripture shows us that this consultation is within the unity of God, but among the diversity of persons who make up the one God, or who are the one God. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Lord needs no other counselor, Calvin said. So there can be no doubt that he consulted with himself. We know from the book of Job, Paul, as he is uh, just a few verses before the one we've got on our wall here, asked the question, who, who is his counselor? And he asked the question because no one. So let us understand here that what's being taught is not that God is consulting with angels or other separate beings or entities who are like him, God-like. Impossible. If you, if you were to say that, you would rob the word God from its meaning, of all its meaning. It wouldn't mean the same thing anymore. We'd be talking about a different kind of entity than when we say God in, in the biblical sense. This is a hint of, or more than a hint, it's, it's showing us that there is something special about God's creation of man. Calvin said, God certainly here might command by his bare word what he wished to be done, but he chose to give this tribute to the excellency of man that he would in a manner enter into consultation concerning his creation. Man is the considered result of God's purpose. Now, God doesn't have to figure anything out. He doesn't have to work out a plan. God has always known whatever he knows. He has always intended to do whatever he does. And if that's starting to get beyond what you can capture in your mind, no problem. That's who God is. So he's not, he did not say, let's, let's sit down and figure out a good plan. That's not what's going on. Calvin has just said, there's no need for this from God's perspective, but what a blessing to us that he would record this in such a way to show us this is different from when I made the rocks. This is different from when I made the plants and the other animals. And we all know it. We all know that. Let me tell you how we know that. No one gets incensed when a rat steals another rat's food. We assign no dignity to any particular rat over another one unless you have a pet rat. I don't recommend that. But I'm aware of no groups who are angry because there's no justice being worked out in the realm of rats. But when one human steals food from another human, we all agree, wait, we're dealing with an ethical, moral problem here. And that was a helpful illustration uh, from an article that I read on the topic. And God is saying, let us make man. And here's why we have the dignity. Here's the mark of the dignity. Mankind, thirdly, mankind is created in the image of God. Mankind, specifically of all of creation, is the image bearer of God. And then... You say, what is the image of God? It's certainly not physical likeness. What is it? Well, it is the representation of God's communicable attributes. The word communicable means it's possible that God's creation, some aspect of God's creation, can reflect and have the same characteristic that God himself has, certainly not to the degree that he does, but that we can point to it. For example, personality or personhood. We are called to know God for eternal life. Jesus defines eternal life as knowing the true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sinned. That knowing is relational. It's not awareness. And this points to personhood and personality. Fellowship is possible. We have fellowship with God and with one another. 
and our capacity to have fellowship with one another is because we are the image bearers of God. It includes love. It includes love. This is more than what we see in the animal kingdom of just an instinctive protection of, of their own. This is beyond that. As a matter of fact, when we think of what agape love is, and when we understand that God in salvation is acting not in any way because he has a need or that he is, he, he is needing some type of reciprocal relationship, but that he is simply saving sinners because he by nature is gracious and loving. Then we begin to understand how different the word love is when we think of it in God's terms versus what we see anywhere else in creation. Except humans are in a sense capable of that and call to it. And the first act of love is that God loves us. And so we have that. We have the capacity to point the universe to the glory of God in the way that He loves, by the way that we love Him and love one another. Now we can't love Him the way He loves us because our love starts with what He has done for us. And God's love does not start with what we have done for Him. Although... All human religion, all human religion is based on that idea. Do you understand? Right out of the gate, when, when man says, all right, I need to be right with God, the first thing he does is, how do I earn his favor? How do I appease him? How do I make myself needy, not needful to him? How do, how do I do this? What do I do? And the first rule is you cannot do that. You don't understand who God is if you're trying to do that. God's love is though comprehensible to us. We, we can think of it, not perfectly and not completely, but the fact that we can sit together and think about God loves us though we don't deserve to be loved and understand what we mean by that is a, is a reference to the image bearing that we're created in His image. Reason. The ability to reason, to think. Everything that is true flows out of who God is. Including the ability to understand the categories of true and false. That, we don't, that's not our invention. As a matter of fact, humanity has been working through the centuries to blur the lines, tear that down because it threatens us, and yet God stands as, what did Jesus say? I am the truth. He didn't say, I know the truth, I can tell you the truth. He said, I am the truth. God is not God, see, because He best knows the truth. He's God because He is the standard of truth. We don't even, we don't even know the concept outside of God. We can consider that. We can reason about that. There are laws of logic, and they indeed are laws, because God exists and God thinks in a certain way. And the way God thinks, that's the way life is. The way God thinks is the way we experience life. We can be as postmodern as we want to, but the reality is if we jump off of buildings, we get hurt, whether we believe it or not. That has nothing to do with it. And no matter how postmodern, enlightened, progressive, liberal, whatever words you want to use, a person, if their paycheck says $352.78, when they go to the bank to get it cashed, they don't have a range of truth in mind, do they? There's one acceptable response from the teller. And that is to provide 300 and what, whatever the number is I said. I can't remember. <laughs> but if it were my check, I know what it says. <laughs> Something is 78 cents. <laughs> See, y'all remembered. Because if your paycheck says that, that's what you want. You're not okay with, here's $200. You brought a paycheck, there's pay. No, it's, no, no, no. 
It's objective. Do you know why we're that way? Because God's that way. God thinks that way. God's thoughts are orderly and logical. And the only reason we can even have English language or any language is because He is a being who is logical and can communicate that. And that's a blessing to every person on the planet, even if they are in idolatry. They are blessed by God to simply have a conversation. And they are expressing the image of God when they do that. All government in order. The fact that we, we mankind, we have been given dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And we can have our political arguments on you know, what to do and how to, how to manage and all that kind of stuff, but, but it's humans that are having the con conversation, not the fish and the birds and the animals. Because we are the image bearers of, of God. Calvin described it, the image, he summed it up in saying, it is the, the perfection of our whole nature as created. Created innocent and functioning for what we were designed for perfectly. Adam and Eve. The, the only flaw that you could even say is the potentiality of rebellion. So dominion is given in light of this. I want to read to you uh, what the psalmist said about this. He said, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings or the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And by the way, that concept of the paths of the seas helped, helped uh, scientists to understand that there are currents in the ocean. That's, a, that's an extra. God has done this. He has created man and he has created man in the image of God. And then he has called all of his creation very good very good now here is where we need to remember that we we are not we are promoting the gospel because the image of God has been marred by man's rebellion he has been marred by man's rebellion well while at the moment of God looking at his creation as he created it, he could say very good. Yet, there was the potential. There was the potential for rebellion. And that's what happened. I want you to look in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. Genesis 3. 22 to 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work, sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Man is no longer very good at this point. There's a problem. Man no longer is in perfect fellowship with God. He is no longer displaying the glory of God as the image bearer of God in the way that he was designed to do so. And the answer 
to that problem caused by sin is the gospel. It's the gospel. Now listen to what Paul said in Colossians 3.10, describing believers. He says, You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And he had said, put off the old man and put on the new man. Listen to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. That is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is, is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now man is created as the image bearer. But man in his rebellion is put out of the Garden of Eden, away from the Tree of Life. And I believe part of this is just mercy and not God not allowing man to be perpetually, physically sustained by the Tree of Life in his status as a sinner against God. Barring fellowship. And leaving things in a perpetual state of a lack of justice and there's no relationship between God and man except justice and there's none so there's no relationship this God is this is an untenable position it's not a possible it's not a possibility and so he's barred from the tree of life because he's lost the image he does no he no longer is functioning in the way that he was designed to function. And it's sin that's brought that, that about. Now I want you to think about the Lord Jesus. As the perfect, ultimate image bearer of God. I want you to think about what the book of Hebrews says. What the book of Hebrews calls him in chapter 1 verse 3 is. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature. He's the exact imprint of his nature. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul referred to him as the last Adam. The last Adam. And see, Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. Adam was to be the image bearer of God and we are his descendants. But sin has marred the image. It's not completely removed it because we, as we read those communicable attributes of God, that, uh, examples of things that we can actually think about and see to some degree in our relationships and even among people who are, are not born again, it's not been completely destroyed and the good news is it's recoverable. But in order for it to be recovered, there had to be another Adam, the last Adam. And he is the one who's ultimately in mind in Psalm 8. Yes, God has made mankind a little lower than the angels and he's given dominion. But it is the Lord Jesus Christ who has accomplished that role perfectly. And yes, he is God, but he is man. He is man. And he perfectly displays the image of God. The exact imprint of his nature. If Adam and Eve's role, if Adam was created to display the glory of God in the communicable attributes of God by bearing the image, Jesus has succeeded fantastically, majestically, perfectly, and ultimately. So that those who are in Christ are described in those two passages you read by, by Paul as being made after the likeness of the Creator. That's what the Christian is. He's now being restored. Restored in his humanity. As a well-functioning image bearer. Now we're not perfectly bearing the image in this life. But there's a time coming when in our glorified bodies we will fulfill our roles as we were originally to do 
And that's because Jesus has done it. And he doesn't just do it in glory, but always. And he did it in our arena. Our arena, which includes sin, the presence of sin. Adam, if you think about it, Adam was 0 for 1 when presented with the evil opportunity for rebellion, right? Adam and Eve, S Satan showed up, sin. Well, Satan was after Jesus the whole time. There was no sin. And so, because of that, he can lead many sons to glory. Because the, he is the exact imprint of his nature. He is... He is God, who's the only one who has the solution to this problem. And He is man living it out in this arena. Living it out in this arena. So that those who belong to Him can be considered joint heirs of Christ. Joint heirs of Christ. Praise the Lord. But I want to talk... In closing, in, the, in, our, in our last moments together, the application of this certainly includes the thought of, in our country, in the world, what should our response be to abortion? Of course we ought to oppose that. It is, it is explicitly murder. Explicitly. But here's the, here's the sixth idea. And I'll, I'll remind you in case you're, you're following along. Mankind is the creation of God and thus his possession. Mankind is the considered creation of God resulting from consultation within the Trinity. Mankind is created in the image of God and is the image bearer of God and has the responsibility to do that. Mankind is created by God, along with all creation, is very good as created by God. But the problem of sin has marred the image of God in mankind. The solution is the gospel. Now, number six, followers of Jesus must live out the truth of the sanctity of life. Followers of Jesus must live out the truth of the sanctity of life. Because of the image of God in man and the majestic, epic work of God in salvation to restore man as image bearer, we must live out the commitment to the sanctity of life. Now I want you to go back to Genesis. Genesis 9, 6. Genesis 9, 6. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. And here we have stated what would be put into law in Exodus 20 and Exodus 21. The Bible says in Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Therefore, murder is a capital offense toward God because it is, it, is, it is implicitly an attack on God. It is implicitly an attack on God. To murder another human is to murder a person who exists for the glory of God at least in the demonstration of those communicable attributes of God that we just Saw. And that person is able to reason and to have relationships and to understand order to the glory of God, whether they ever become a Christian or not. That person has that responsibility and the dignity assigned to that, which makes murder an implicit attack on God. R.C. Sproul said, The moral basis for capital punishment in Genesis is the sanctity of life. And human dignity is derived from God. And therefore, an attack on another human is an attack on God. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about 
government's responsibility. That's a different thing. This is, if you were trying to, to set up some conundrum by saying, well, a government doesn't have the right to, to take the life of an image bearer of God. Well, no, God has told the government what the standard is right here. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. And then we're given the reason. For, because God made man in his own image. So someone who says, I'll not live according to that, that command has committed a capital offense. The one who acts on that. Now this includes abortion. Abortion. Christian, you ought not to be halting between two opinions here. It is certain that the Bible treats the unborn in the womb as a human being. It is certain. There, there's, there's way more examples, but just to, just to give you some ideas of these things, think of John the Baptist when he was in his mother's womb. He's described as leaping for joy. And also to be full of the Spirit from the womb. Think of this, and we'll move on because this is not where we're camping out, but in the incarnation when God became human, did God become, did He take on human flesh? Did He become truly human in the incarnation? God the Son, did He? Yes, He did. He did not show up as a baby, but He was put into Mary's womb. Conception was his starting point for taking on flesh. And that ends the argument for me. The Lord considered the womb the place to go to start that... When we talk about the incarnation, there's a start. To start taking on that flesh. He became flesh. And it started in the womb. Not as an infant or not just as a person. So abortion is murder. Peter Barnes has written uh, well on this topic, and I commend that to you. An excellent explanation of how the Bible does indeed extend protection from murder to those in the womb. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He's, of course, he spoke plainly about the evils of Nazism. He also spoke of abortion. He said, Destruction of the embryo in the mother's womb is a violation of the right to live which God has bestowed upon this nascent life. To raise the question whether we are here concerned already with a human being or not is merely to confuse the issue. The simple fact is that God certainly intended to create a human being and that this nascent human being has been deliberately deprived of his life and that is nothing but murder. Even if you try to make some progress saying that's not a human being yet, the question of what did God intend is another place to just slam, slam the door. Job's friend Elihu said, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now everything that Elihu said uh, shouldn't be taken to be perfectly true, but that's true. He said, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Job 33, 4. Of course, Jeremiah the prophet was told by God, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. And by the way, it doesn't say, Jeremiah, you knew me before I formed you in the womb. No. Jeremiah did not exist before God formed him in the womb except in God's mind. He already knew him and knew all about him. Had a relationship with Jeremiah and then brought Jeremiah into being in a physical sense. Psalm 103, the first part of that verse says, Know that the Lord, or Yahweh, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. In the womb. Now I want to show you how Jesus applied that. This idea that we must follow Jesus, and we must, in doing so, live out the truth of the sanctity of life. And I want you to understand that that applies and is crucial in our relationships with one another as Christians. 
I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. 21 to 26. We ought to oppose abortion. We must. Or we're denying what God has said. But we need to understand there's more to honoring and celebrating the sanctity of life than just, you know, having a pro-life sticker or something. We have an opportunity to truly and really promote and celebrate the sanctity of human life every day. If you are in relationship with another person, particularly another Christian, you have the opportunity to celebrate and promote the sanctity of human life. Look at what Jesus said. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And that's the Sanhedrin, the, the high court. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire, or Gehenna of fire, where, where actually child sacrifices had happened in Israel's past. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember, there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What I want you to see here though is Jesus includes in the commandment you shall not murder what's in your heart. What's in your heart. But I say to you, it's his way of saying, I have the authority to say this to you. I'm teaching you how to understand this. Now he's not saying that it's just as evil and the consequences are just as bad for a person to want to harm another person than if they actually do harm another person. That's, that's silliness. He's not saying that. But what he is saying is that you have violated the law of God if you have in your heart these things. Now, let me just tell you what they are. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother, and this uh, literally is who, who says raka to his brother, uh, this is a, an expression of contempt for, for his head. It's like saying, you're stupid. You stupid. You, what you say and think has no value to me. To write off somebody because of contempt for his or her head. And then the other one, whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. This is contempt for his heart and character. It would be like saying, you scoundrel. Now let me tell you something. We live among fallen creatures, depraved sinners. Is there any stupidity going on out there? Indeed, indeed. Are there any scoundrels out there? Is it a sin to recognize that? It is not. But if your relationship with your brother, your brother, and probably in the context, he's talking about a Jewish person to another Jewish person, but certainly... Because, because of the grafting in of the Gentiles, the principle extends to believers, other believers. If this, if this characterizes our relationship with another believer, and there's no attempt to bring the gospel into the situation, there's no attempt to bring what God says, there's no speaking the truth in love, well, it says it will be li liable to the hell of fire, which means it's evidence that you're not truly born again. If you want to see, you know, we're told, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. If you, you can study all you want, all the law and the prophets. But if the end result of that is not, I'm pursuing love for God with all that I am, and I love my neighbor as myself, and I'm growing in that. I'm not doing it perfectly, I'm growing. Then you don't, it's, it's completely, you've missed it. Which is why a guy could say, Jesus could say, to groups of people, a group of people 
in Israel in the first century who were fastidiously studying and trying to keep the law sons of hell sons of the devil because the issue is love if you want to be known for someone who supports and is for the sanctity of human life you need to love the epistles are full of the one another's Jesus said one another, love one another we read that from 1st John this is a way you can make a difference in the world. Love one another. And make sure that there are no obstacles to fellowship between you and your one another's, <laughs> the others. This is saying, and by the way, this is pretty important. Don't you think the Lord Jesus thinks that worship to God is important? Don't, do you think he does? I think he does. And yet... He says there's a time when it's appropriate to interrupt your worship. There's a time when it's appropriate to stop your act of worship, your sacrificial act of worship. What could possibly be a reason to interrupt? In verse 23, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You know what the Lord wants more than you singing a song of praise or you giving an offering in the offering basket. He wants you to be reconciled to your brother. Now you have to be reconciled to him first. And after that, he wants you to be reconciled to your brother. It's interesting that the person who leaves is not the person who has something against somebody, but it's the person who thinks somebody might have something against them. That means the other one surely is true, right? I mean, this is, this is the person who knows that somebody may have something against them. And this is what Jesus said to do. Remember what? She say, well, I thought this was a sermon on the sanctity of human life. We're talking about murder, right? Murder is the, is the, uh, it's the most explicit attack you can make on the sanctity of human life. Jesus is talking about murder. This is in the context of him establishing how do you live with gospel implications about the truth of the sanctity of human life in mind. This is how you do it. Jesus knows that the vast majority of his people are not, we're not going to be having murder cases amongst ourselves of actual murder where on Sunday, well, who killed who this week? That has n I, never in my ministry, I was ordained into the ministry in 1993. I've never had to deal with that. I'm sure some churches have. I have not seen that. And so Jesus is saying, listen, take a step back. Go deeper. Go into your heart. You love life. You love the source of life. Here's, here is the standard. Here is what's prohibited. And what leads to that act of murder. Zero in on our and from our concerns over the devil's disregard for the sanctity of human life. Unfortunately, our world's disregard for the sanctity of human life to how we treat each other. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus himself teaching love one another. Do you? Do you see the contradiction in your life to proclaim yourself to be pro-life and to go around with grudges and, and not care what kind of relationship you have with one another in light of what Jesus said? There's no way around this. We're in rebellion against God. If we're satisfied with my relationship is, it doesn't matter. It does matter if you care about the sanctity of human life. Now, we read 1 John 3, 11 to 18 earlier, but I want to read to you 1 John 4, 20 and 21. I want you to hear the seriousness of this. I want you to understand what's going on, what Jesus is identifying here when he ex expands the understanding of the law and what's prohibited uh, 
in the, the phrase, you shall not murder, here's why it's so important. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. It doesn't say he might be a liar. It says he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And you love your brother because your brother belongs to God. And an attack on your brother is an implicit attack on God. And God is the author of all life and he, everybody answers to him. We're not the standard, he is. So if you believe in the sanctity of human life, listen, let us continue to, to make our voice known in the community, in, in, in our world, that abortion is wrong. It is wrong. It is murder, and God is not pleased with it. There is forgiveness for sin in the gospel. And so we ought to hold that out. But if we want to make a difference moment by moment, if we want to promote and celebrate the sanctity of life, then let's love one another. Let's love one another. Now, if you're here today and you don't, you don't know how to love people who are unlovable, you need to understand God's love. And that is that God loved all of us who are unlovable in such a way that He gave His Son to be the substitute to take the punishment for our sin. And through Jesus, the last Adam, the, the restorer of the image of God in humanity, we can be right with God. You need to know about that. Don't leave without asking questions. If you need to know about that, ask questions. Ask, ask someone that you meet. Ask me. I would be glad to talk to you about that. But let us, let us love one another. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Lord, you called Adam as he was created very good. And then you have promised us, those whom you have redeemed, eternal life in glory, sharing in, in enjoying, being amazed by your glory forever. That's our future. Thank you for grace. Help us, Lord, to live for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll let's sing.